We love you, Lord, and we praise you. May today bring honor and glory to you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, I'm so excited to be here on Ugly Sweater Christmas Sunday. What a day to be invited here. And uh, I was going to preach on the virgin birth, but since I see all the pictures of pastor on your sweaters, I'm actually going to preach on repentance. <laughs> uh, I had to borrow an ugly sweater from my pastor. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited about preaching in this because it, it, I, I just turned it on before I came up here. So it's got very annoying lights and it has little jingle bells. You hear them? Yeah. So if I say something that's really good, I'll probably jingle the bells like, Pastor Kevin's awesome. So anyway, yeah, <laughs> so it's so wonderful to be here. Now, I do want to give a couple disclaimers before I get started, because it might change how you view me. One is I'm very good friends with Casey and Laura Kimball. Yeah, I know. Repent. Yeah. <laughs> Repent. <laughs> so uh, we are responsible for us. Uh, getting here today, and uh, we love the Kimballs very much. My wife Becky is here, and uh, she's uh, sitting here between. Uh, we have four kids, and we live in uh, Dallas, Texas, where I run the, uh, def the Defending the Faith Alliance. And I have uh, a program that we defend churches. We defend churches and ministries and Christian businesses. So we have one program called Church Shield, with this, which this church is in, which is really, really cool. Uh, we have liberty issues. Uh, you know, the church is under attack in America. And so we're doing everything we can to preserve churches' religious liberty uh, we're in all kinds of legal battles. Uh, I'm licensed all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. We have a few cases, I think, that probably will go uh, to the Supreme Court, but we help churches with uh, everything. We're actually suing on behalf of a few of our churches. It's uh, uh, crazy times that we, we, we live in. We also help ministries. We also help Christian businesses, um, and that's our newest program. It's actually one week old. It's called Kingdom uh, kingdom Shield, and uh, Christian businesses too are under attack because a lot of people are saying, well, religious liberty is only for the church, but not for businesses. And uh, we've got a case right now that involves a, a business where they're, they're forcing uh, one of the people we represent to use false pronouns where they work. And this person is a believer and they consider that lying. They're not going to do it. We represent them and uh, we help give them, uh, we, ha we help get them a religious liberty ex exemption. So we actually have a couple of these. Our pronouns cases are going to be exploding across our country. Um, some of the things that we, in we deal with in churches involves social transitioning, <coughs> restrooms, marriage policies. Uh, you know, most churches have a policy that says, hey, we only marry one man to one woman. But Pastor, you'll have two guys show up and say, hey, we want you to marry us. And you'll say, well, we only marry men and women. And one of them will say, well, I identify as a woman. And so this is some of the stuff that we're facing and we're helping churches uh, navigate through. And also now uh, Christian businesses uh, uh, that want these, these same protections. So you can read about us. We also have a television show called Defending the Faith. It's on Saturday nights on now Christian Television, you can read all about all the stuff that we're doing at um, defendingthefaith.law. So you can go and, and, and find out about us. Now, um, you're probably picking up that not only am I a preacher, uh, I have a master's and a PhD in theology from Southwestern Seminary, but I'm also an attorney. And so I have a law degree from Texas A&M. And so I know that's really strange to some of you because you're like, I didn't know you could be a Christian and an attorney. And, but you can, and I'm one of the good guys. And so I represent, uh, you know, that's what we do is we do kingdom uh, cases and we, we represent people. You know, not all lawyers are bad people. You know, in, here in Texas, we have a special law just for lawyers. Did you know if you're a lawyer in Texas and you die, you have to be buried at least six feet under? Hmm? You know why that is? Because deep down, we're good people. Yes. <laughs> Now, deep down, yes, it'll sink in some of you a little bit. Uh, 
Now, let me tell you before I, I get started and talk about the virgin birth here that tonight at 6 p.m., we're having a seminar on how you can have a free will. So this is probably the neatest thing, one of the neatest things that we do um, for anybody that's a member of one of our Churchill churches, uh, you can get a free will, you can get a free, li a free living will, which includes powers of attorney over the person and the estate. We also do revocable living trust for free which those cost $5,000 for any attorney in Texas. There's free and uh, everything that we have. We also do advanced directives. Anything that you need in estate planning, we have for free because we believe that that's a matter of stewardship. Um, you know, two out of three people in America do not have a will. Two out of three adults. Um, how many of you in here do not have a will? I know a guy that's going to help you today. So be sure and show up at six o'clock. So let me tell you this. So if, if you die without a will, I know three things about you. Number one, I know that you left too much money to the government, maybe all of it. I mean, and some of you have already told me nightmare stories about your families that you've, you've had involving this. Number two, if you don't have a will, you left way too little to your family. And you know what the Bible says in Proverbs? It says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But here's the, here's the worst thing. If you die without a will, you left zero to the church. I mean, nothing, not a shekel, not a Frito, a Dorito, a Cheeto. I mean, you left nothing to God. So when we do our seminar this afternoon, I'm going to teach you how you can have this all for free. I'm going to teach you how to give less money to the government, leave way more to your family and leave something to the church if you want to. Now, we'll do your will for free and there's no catch. There's no catch at all with these free wills. But we do ask that, you know, if you want to leave a bequest to Grace Point at Eagle Heights, you can do that. And uh, so this year, we just started this program with free wills this year. Uh, uh, I, I became really convinced that this is something that we need in our churches for stewardship because you don't wanna leave all that money all your money and your property to the government. And so uh, it will ask you if you would like to leave a bequest, a gift to your church. You don't have to. We'll still do it for free. And no one will know whether you do or you don't unless you, you know, want to let the, the church know. Um, but this year, I will just tell you, in our churches that we have, um, our churches have, uh, church members have written over $16 million in bequest for our partner churches. Um, and so it's a really great thing because... You know, y'all are a pretty young congregation, but, you know, if you'll put that in, it'll build your next building, it'll build your next campus or whatever you have. Um, and some people, you know why some people don't make a will? Because they're afraid it's going to speed up their death, right? It sounds morbid. But, you know, actually, it's a, it's a great thing to, 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 to do. I had a guy, I did one of these will seminars, and by the way, tonight, you can come and you can ask me any question, like, you know, Will I lose my house with Medicaid? Do I need a ladybird deed? Do I need a transfer on debt deed? You know, how do I avoid probate? All that stuff is on the table tonight. So you'll be blessed. I mean, when we do this seminar, it's probably one of the neatest things that I do for churches. And uh, we talk about, you know, the stewardship of, of, of this whole thing. But I had a guy come up to me uh, in East Texas. And, and, and after I did the will seminar, his wife, he didn't even go to the church. His wife got him to come. And he said, he said preacher, he said, you got me. I'm going to do a will. I'm going to do it today. And he said, you want to know why? And I'd probably given 10 reasons you ought to do it. And I said, well, tell me. And he goes, because I'm, I'm tired of the devil trying to kill me. I was like, really? Um, and he goes, yeah. He goes, I'm going to leave so much to God, he's going to keep me alive. <laughs> and so, Pastor Kevin, I called one of my friends, I, one of my pastor friends going home. I said, man, listen to what this guy just said to me. And my pastor friend goes, that's good theology, Frank. The devil doesn't, kingdom's not divided against itself. I was like, really? I'm going to up the amount in my will for my church. Uh, so, but you know, that's, that's how I feel. You know, the Bible says Samson killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his life. And, uh, you know, and so just, I'm just telling you personally, for me, I tithe my, my, in my life and I'm going to tithe in my death. I'm going to make it, make a difference. So that's, that's the one thing that, uh, so we combine both, but you'll have all that for free. The rest of your life, you come tonight, we'll teach you uh, you'll have your own dashboard and your own thing, and it'll, 
you, you know, you'll be fixed up for life. You'll never have to pay an attorney to, to do that. Well, I want to tell you just a little bit of my story. Laura asked me to kind of share with you a little bit of my background as I, as I get going. But I was an atheist for 21 years. And as an adult, I was challenged by a pastor who witnessed to me uh, at a church just like this um, to disprove Christianity. He was witnessing to me, and I started telling him, none of it's true. You know, um, there's not a God, and the Bible's full of errors, and Jesus didn't even ever exist. I mean, it's all false. And he said, he said Frank, I challenge you to disprove Christianity. And I took him up on that challenge. That's why I'm standing here today. I studied Christianity from cover to cover. I read the entire Bible cover to cover before I became a Christian. I actually studied all nine major world religions. And here's what I found out in my investigation. And, I, and I've written books on, on, on this. So I discovered there is powerful evidence from science, history, archaeology, prophecy, many different areas, which demonstrates beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christianity is the truth. You know, you don't have to check your brains in at the door to become a Christian. Becoming a Christian is one of the most reasonable, intelligent decisions that you can ever make. And believing in God is not a, a leap into the darkness. It's a step into the light. And I don't know if you're here today and maybe you just showed up today at church and and maybe you've been skeptical, maybe you've been looking at things. I'm glad you came today because today I'm going to talk about some evidence um, that talks about why Christianity is truth. And today I want to focus on the virgin birth. Now, we've already heard our passage read out of Matthew chapter 1. And what's interesting is we're talking about the virgin birth. Now, there are some skeptics who say they will not believe in Christianity because of the virgin birth. I had a skeptic one time who I was doing a debate. I've done tons of debates with atheists on college campuses and stuff. And he said, he said, you know, I just can't believe in the virgin birth because it's a miracle. Well, if it wasn't a miracle, it wouldn't be a sign. It wouldn't be anything special about it. So the virgin birth is something truly absolutely astonishing. But in the text that was just read by one of your elders, we see that God himself affirms the virgin birth, the father. And then it talks about the Holy Spirit in that passage who came upon Mary. The angels affirm the virgin birth. Joseph is commanded to, to affirm the virgin birth. Mary receives this truth as the virgin birth. But then think about this. Jesus, who's born himself as a baby, okay? Now, we, we learned that he is God with us. We learned that he's two things, really, in this story about the virgin birth. We learned that he's a savior who will take away our sins. And we learned that he is none other than Emmanuel, which is God with us. Now, the question is, Okay, Mary believes it, Joseph believes it, the angel believes it, God is proclaiming it. What's going to happen when Jesus grows up? Is he going to accept this? Is, is, he, is he there? And what we discover is, is that Jesus Christ lives his earthly life until he was 30. And when he was 30, he began his earthly ministry. And Jesus Christ... As he began his earthly ministry, he made an unbelievable, one-of-a-kind, unique claim. And here's what Jesus said. Because everybody's waiting to hear what Jesus says about this. And here's what Jesus said, that he was God. Now, if you just show up somewhere and announce to people that you're God, we have a word for you. It's called mentally ill. I mean, imagine if someone came in here today and claimed that they were God. What would you think about that? I heard the story about a man. He was a doctor. He just graduated. He just got his medical degree. And his first job was working in a mental institution. And he was noticing all the, you know, disturbed patients who were in the mental institution. And he saw a guy standing in the corner who was like this. He had his 
hand in his coat pocket and he just stood at attention all day long. And he went over and he asked one of the nurses, he said, what's the deal with the guy in the corner who's, who's always over there standing there like, and she goes, oh, he thinks he's Napoleon. He goes, I mean, Napoleon Dynamite? I mean, what? No, he thinks he's Napoleon Bonaparte, the emperor. Doctor says, well, I'm going to go cure Napoleon my first day. So the doctor goes over and he, and he holds out his hand. He said, hey, I'm Dr. Brown. What's your name? And the man goes, the man goes, why, I'm Napoleon. The doctor said, really? Who told you you were Napoleon? And the man said, why, God did. The guy standing beside him said, no, I didn't. I mean, if you claim to be something more than a mere human being on this planet, you had better be able to back it up. The true story is told about Muhammad Ali. He was once the heavyweight champion on the world, of the world. And he was sitting in first class on a, on a, on a big time jetliner. And, the, and the, the, the jet began to hit severe turbulence. It was so bad, the captain actually feared for the lives of the passengers. He turned on the fastened seatbelt sign and everybody who was scared turned on their seatbelt but the chant, the stewardess who's sitting over by him, she goes over to Ali and informs him. She says, sir, you're going to have to fasten your seatbelt, to which Ali wouldn't do it. He just stared at her and he glared at her. And she said, sir, you're going to have to fasten your seatbelt. And Ali just stared back at her and finally said this, Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which the flight attendant replied, Superman don't need no airplane. <laughs> Buckle up, buddy. I mean, if you claim to be something more than a mere human being on this planet, you had better be able to back it up. And Jesus Christ, when he came to this planet, he announced that he was the Savior of the world. Do you know what a Savior is? A Savior. The angel said, and they shall call his name Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. Now, to be a savior means to be able to save. Okay? It's actually the image of a lifeguard. So a lifeguard is trying to save you from what? From drowning. But can you imagine a lifeguard who took a, can you imagine somebody who took a job as a lifeguard who wasn't able to swim? What, what good would that lifeguard be? It's like the story of the lifeguard that wanted to be an evangelist and everybody kept drowning because he kept going, I see that hand. I see that hand. I heard the, also read the true story one time about a lady. She was watching her grandson for her kids and uh, she went over to their house. They had a pool. The grandson was playing in the, in the backyard and she saw him fall into the pool. Now, he was too little to swim. Now, the grandmother was also unable to swim. Um, she, she knew she, she, she didn't have time to call 911. She just ran out there. She dove in to save the child. Now, the sad ending to this story is, is that a few hours later, both were found deceased in the bottom of the pool. Now, you could say this grandmother was sincere in her desire to save her grandkid. But she couldn't save him because she was not able to save. Listen, to be a savior, not only do you have to be willing to save, you must be able to save. Do you realize that in the New Testament times, in the first century, there were 29 men who claimed to be the Jewish Messiah. 29 men who claimed to be the savior. Can anybody in here Name five of them besides Jesus. Anybody. Can anybody name four of them? How about three? You know why you can't name them? Because they didn't have any evidence for their claim. They couldn't back up their claim. Now, think about this. We live in a world in which a new religion is started every single day. A new religion pops up every single day. A new Religious guru who pops up and says things like, I have the answer, I've heard from God, I know stuff, and uh, they claim to be the Savior. You know what the problem is? Is that they're sinful. See, because only somebody without sin could save. 
from sin. See, if you have a sin problem, you shouldn't be trying to solve somebody else's sin problem. So Jesus Christ, he was a sinless Savior. Now, that's very, very important. Um, You know, and Jesus Christ did something 2,000 years ago that really no one's ever done. Jesus Christ not only claimed that he was God. Listen to this. And this is really just a one-point sermon. Here it is, one point. Now, um, you ever seen a a preacher preach a one-point sermon? I preached a no-point sermon many, many times, Pastor Kevin, but today I'm going to try to preach a one-point sermon. And here's the point. Jesus Christ made a -a one-of-a-kind, unique claim, and he backed up his claim. Now listen, if you were God, and you were going to come to this planet, and you were going to try to convince people that you were God who became flesh, that you were the way, the truth, and the life, how would you do it? Well, the way that Jesus Christ did it is that he began his visit to earth as the, the, the second person of the Godhead by means of a virgin birth. 30 years later, he would begin his earthly ministry. And he unleashed an avalanche of miracles that arrested this world's attention. He healed men blind from birth. He raised the dead. He did miracles that would astound the modern scientific community today. But today, when many skeptics look at the life and the miracles of Jesus Christ, they say things like, you know, Jesus could have never um, done those miracles in our time. He only was able to do those in the first century because he was able to fool the pre-scientific people of his generation. People today are so much smarter. But you know, when you look at the kind of miracles that Jesus did, people still can't do those miracles today. Jesus healed people blind from birth, congenital blindness. He raised the dead. Nobody's raising the dead today, by the way. I mean, a lot of people will say, hey, you know, science has all the answers. We don't need God anymore. Science has no answers, okay? Science, science has no answers. Science can't tell you where you were 100 years before you were born. Science can't tell you where this world came from or why, or why you exist or why you're different. See, science tries to tell you that everything in the world came from a gigantic explosion and that you came from green goo. And that's all you are. It's just a bunch of chemicals, just a goo moving around like this. Here's a bunch of goo. And therefore, there's nothing special or unique about you. That's what science says, that, that you're fungible. You know what fungible means? It's the same. If somebody gives you a dollar and they promise you a dollar, say, I'm going to give you a dollar. And you see them with a stack of dollars and go, no, I really wanted that other one over there. Okay. No. See, dollars are fungible, just like Cheetos are fungible. You've seen one M&M, you've seen them all. Okay. So science tries to say all we are is just moving chemicals. But you know what? Is that true? Is it really? I mean... I'm going to tell you something that you've suspected your whole life, and I'm going to tell you it's true. There's never, ever, ever been anybody like you. There'll never be another you. Your suspicions are correct. You are special. You are unique. You are created in the very image of God. And you were created for a reason. You were created for a purpose. But you have a problem. You have a sin problem. And so science is trying to tell you they have all, they can't tell you Uh, they can't tell you what's going to happen to you after you die. Science gives us all kinds of false information because science, without God, there there is no true knowledge. There's no true wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know, when I read this Bible as an atheist and I I read it through, some people say, you know, Frank, what was the thing that, that really got you? What was the thing that really got you? Well, the resurrection, which I'll talk about in just a second, was got me. But I'll tell you what stopped me in my tracks. When Jesus was talking to a group of people and he said, he said, uh, you can't hear me because my sheep hear my voice. So I'm reading that because I'm, I'm not hearing God. I'm reading the Bible as an ape. My sheep hear my. And so I started thinking, who, who are Jesus' sheep? And I started thinking about what I was doing. I was trying to read the Bible to disprove it. I was trying to read the Bible to find a loophole. And I started realizing, I don't think I'm one of Jesus' sheep. 
here. And you know what? I'm probably never going to hear his voice. Because here's who Jesus' sheep are. People who love truth. I'm going to tell you something. If you love truth, you're going to love Jesus. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says the truth can set you free. And if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. And I'll tell you something. I gave my life to Christ. I was a 21-year-old atheist. I can tell you the exact moment that the Holy Spirit came into my life. I have never, ever been the same. I'm telling you, the, 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 the Spirit filled me. I, I got up the next morning. The air was different. Light was different. Things were beautiful. I could hear birds chirping like I've never heard before. You know, the Bible says that someone who's in Christ becomes a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old life has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. Has something like that ever happened to you? Have you ever had that time in your life where you say, you know what? I'm going to let go of my doubts and I'm going to give this to God. I'm going to make my life count for God. You know, the thing that I had just kind of just grieved me was that it took me 21 years of, of my life to, 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 to figure that out. But you know what? Since then, I've dedicated my life to defending the faith, defending Christianity. So I defend Christ not only in the churches, but I defend Christ in the court. People say, why are you a lawyer, Frank? I say, man, some of the greatest sermons that have ever been preached were preached in the book of Acts in court, in court. Now think about this. Paul is before Agrippa and, and, and Paul, he's representing himself, pro se attorney. And Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. And Agrippa goes, oh man, I was going to let you go. I was, I was actually going to let you go today. But now... You're going to have to go to Rome. Some people say this, the dumbest legal decision ever in the history of the world was when Paul appealed in front of a guy that was about to let him go. But you know what? If you read on in the book of Acts, read on. Because he appealed and went to Rome, the Bible says in the book of Acts, he preached the gospel to great and small, to kings and queens. And you know what? That's what I'm trying to do with my life. I'm trying to take whatever influence I have and make it for the glory of God. And you know what? That's my prayer for you. And you say, well, Frank, I'm not a preacher. I, you know, listen, you might, you might be a, a Christian business person. You know what? You need to make your business count for God. There was a man named R.G. Letourneau, and he failed and he failed and he failed in business until one day he said, you know what? I've had all these human partners. He said, God, I'm going to make you my partner. And he made it, and there's, there's books on this, and he supported Billy Graham, and I mean, he helped raise up Billy Graham and, and become amazing things and became a great supporter. But, you know, is God your partner? Is God your partner at work, in your job, in your employment, wherever you are in your kingdom? Every one of you in here has a kingdom. And you know what? We need to make, be making an impact for God because there's never been anybody like Jesus. He's unique. These miracles that he, that he did. So if somebody in the world religious scene st tries to step up and say, you know what? I'm the new savior. I'm the latest and greatest. Okay, so let me ask you, you know, have you ever sinned? That's my question. You know, by the way, um, I, I met a guy one time in the airport. I was, I was sitting there reading the Bible, Pastor Kevin, and you know, the plane's running late and stuff. So I just, I, I'm, I'm done studying for my sermon. I'm reading the Bible. This guy came up to me, taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, you like my book? <laughs> and I, I didn't have any other books. I just had the Bible and I was like, yeah, I, I love God's word. He said, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> I thought I couldn't resist. I was like, I didn't get your name. Who are you? He said, well, I'm the author of that book. I'm God. I jumped up. I was like, I've been looking for you. I was like, and it was, I said, this is such perfect timing because our plane was late. Everything had closed. We're right in the front of McDonald's. And I said, look, God, look, I'm starving. What I need you to do right now is I need you to make a quarter pounder of cheese and put it right here. And he just looked at me. I said, come on, God. Now, if you're really God, you can be able to do the kinds of things that God can do. And finally, he said, well, I just don't do that anymore. I said, sir, there are two supreme facts in this universe that you need to be aware of. Number one, 
There is a God. And number two, you ain't him. See, because if you're God, you ought to be able to do the kinds of things that God can do. Now, let me tell you what might be the most understated miracle that Jesus ever did. What's the first miracle that Jesus ever did? Turn water into wine. But here's the big one that no one ever talks about. The perfect life. He lived the perfect life. Jesus never sinned. So unlike you and unlike me, Jesus Christ was, he did not have an earthly father. That's why the virgin birth becomes so important. Because by the way, you know, um, do you know what the two most attacked miracles are in the history of the Christian church? Number one is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the second most attacked miracle by skeptics is the virgin birth. The reason they attack it is because it's serious business. If Jesus rose again from the dead, you know he's savior of the world. But I'm gonna tell you something else. If Jesus was born of a virgin, he is the savior of the world. Now, sinful saviors can't save from sin. And by the way, that's, the proof is, is that they're all dead. You know, every religious lifeguard that's ever lived, Buddha, He's six feet under. Muhammad, he's six feet under. Confucius, six feet under. Elvis, I think he's still, I think he's gone. Some people are still seeing. Michael Jackson, you know. But these guys, are, they're, they're all dead. But Jesus Christ is alive, risen from the dead. And so Jesus Christ is the sinless Savior. You remember what Jesus said over and over again? People were trying to attack him in the Bible. They were trying to, first of all, attack him for his miracles, but it's not the reason that you think. So, you know what's interesting about the miracles of Jesus Christ? And this is an apologetics issue. Did you know that no first century eyewitness ever denied that Jesus could do miracles? Now, isn't that strange? That someone didn't try to expose Jesus as a clever Harry Houdini. A clever David Copperfield and went, here's how Jesus actually does his magic tricks. No! All the skeptics in the Bible, they didn't meet to discuss Jesus, how, how Jesus did his miracles. Why'd they meet? To discuss him, to, to discuss, to see how they could stop him from doing any more. So how did skeptics in Jesus' day explain away his miracles? They said that he did them by the power of Satan. Now, even the, even the Jewish Talmud, which dates from 100 to 500 AD, says that Jesus did miracles because he had sorcerer power. Now, I studied all this when I was an atheist. And do you think an atheist goes, oh, that explains everything. Satan did it. No. Listen, think about this. If you're an atheist, if you discovered Satan is real, what would that mean? That would mean that God is real. Now, I just spoke last month to the high school in Bonham, Texas. And it was sponsored by the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. We had 600 students, Pastor Kevin, who came to hear me talk about my journey from atheism to Christ. I gave them all a copy of my, my book, Sherlock's Faith, which, which talks about all the evidence that I have for Christianity. And we had one of the guys who was there and he came down and he shook my hand afterwards and he said, Dr. Harper, he said, I want you to know I'm a Christian because my uncle. He said, my uncle was in a war and he said, my uncle was an atheist and he said, my uncle claims, I don't know if he did or not, but I'm just telling you what he said. He said, my uncle claims he saw Satan. And he said, when he said he saw Satan, that made him go, if that thing's real, I need to find a power that can defeat him. This, is, this thing's evil. And he turned to God. Now, Here's what this kid said. He said, this guy who thinks he saw Satan led everybody in his family to Christ, all his brothers and sisters, and, and his dad was the uncle of him and led him to Christ. And he said, I'm a Christian today because my uncle thinks he saw Satan. That's what it was last month. But think about this. I don't know whether he did or not, but if Satan is real, God is real. And by the way, have you ever done a study on Satan to see where, where the origin of Satan is. By the way, if you tried to figure out who Satan was and you didn't have a Bible, could you do it? 
Did you know that if you do a study on the history of Satan, like read like Elaine Pagel's book on the history of Satanism, uh, history of Satan, here's what you'll learn. That other religions, and other religions have a Satan, other religions who have a Satan, they got Satan because they stole him from the Bible. Okay? They didn't invent him. They, they, like Mormons have Satan. Islam has a Satan. And here's the deal. I mean, somebody should have told them, you know, and Satanists follow Satan. Somebody needs to tell these people that the Satan in the Bible is a loser. He's a defeated foe. He's going down in flames. Why would anybody, you know, try to, to, to adopt him? But here's the thing. Satan was created by God. So if Satan is real, God is real. Now, so simply saying Jesus did his miracles by the power of Satan answers nothing. Um, but here's the other thing, too. Any of these people who claim to be this great religious leader, you need to see if they have a sinless life. Do you know what Jesus did? Jesus, he, he, he said this to people. He constantly challenged people. When you, when you read the Bible, look at this very carefully. He said, which of you convinces me of sin? Jesus constantly tried to challenge people to catch him in sin. They couldn't do it. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Do you realize the virgin birth is so important? Because the virgin birth ensures the sinless nature of Jesus Christ. The reason you have a sinful nature is because you inherited it. Not from your mama, but from your father. Okay, and by the way, you know, the genealogies in the Bible that everybody skips over, that's one of the reasons they're so important. It shows how, how sin went from generation to, to, to generation. Um, and then we get, we get to Jesus who's born, the savior of the world, the second Adam, the one who can reverse the curse. And he proved it. He proved it not only by doing miracles, by coming into the world, by means of a virgin birth, but then he rose again from the dead. Do you realize the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest attested religious miracle in all of antiquity? So what I usually do before I end my sermon is I say this. I'll tell you about this, Kevin, because we were talking about, you know, you could go, I could go on preaching forever and ever. So here's what I like to do. I like to go and I close. Okay. I'm doing it right now. And I close. Now, the reason I do that is because it relaxes people. They're like, oh, he's finally going to land the plane. He, he, he didn't even realize how long he was going, man. He's been preaching 40 minutes. And so that's why, I, that's, that's why I like to say, and I close, because it just relaxes people. That's why I close six or seven times. You should try it, Kevin. It's, it's awesome. Now, I really want to close with this story. So I was doing a debate with an atheist one time. And, uh, you know, some of the things he said just really just jumped out at me. He said two things that jumped out at me. He said, one, he said, he said, Dr. Harbour, he said, I don't believe in Christianity because I don't believe in all the miracles. I was like, what? He goes, yeah, all those miracles. I, I got a problem with that. That just puts me in a brain stoppage. And I was like, well, wait a second here. So you're saying if God couldn't do miracles, you would be way more apt to believe in him. Yeah. I was like, okay. So what are you going to do when you say, God, how'd you create the world? What's God going to go say? I got lucky. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, can you imagine thinking that somehow it would be easier to believe in God without miracles? By the way, that's how I became an atheist. My parents did take me to church. They took me to a liberal church where I was taught that Adam and Eve weren't real people. There wasn't a real flood. There wasn't a real Jonah. He wasn't really swallowed. But these are just made up stories to try to help people believe in God. Now, here's the deal. If you start to think some of the Bible's not true, guess what? Guess what a little kid will do? He'll start to go, maybe all of it's not true. That's how I became who I became as, as an atheist. And you know what? I'm telling you what. Now I stand on the authority of the word of God. I believe every single word of this Bible because I believe that Jesus Christ is the truth. I believe Jesus Christ's truth surpasses your truth. Here's the final thing the atheist said to me. He said, he said and I'll tell you lastly, he said, Dr. Harbour, I don't believe that dead people can come back from the grave. You know what I said? 
Amen. I don't either. Amen. I went to Texas A&M. Dead people stay dead. He goes, no, no, no. You're not following me here. I don't believe that a person who dies can ever come back. I said, I don't either. I said, man, I've noticed it. Man, graveyards are great evidence of this, isn't it? Dead, when people die, they tend to stay dead. I'm with you, man. We're on the same page. We agree on something. He goes, no, because I'm sitting there saying, Jesus can't come back from the grave. I said, oh, now you just change the subject. I said, if Jesus was only a mere man, you would be right. But I said, Jesus Christ wasn't merely a man. He was God incarnate in the flesh. And he came back from the dead. And here's what he said to me. He said, well, that's just your opinion. I said, let me tell you something. My opinion came back from the dead. What can your opinion do? See, we live in a world with all these different opinions. But, and I'm going to tell you what, all these were different religiously, all this different stuff. I can tell you, I've, I've lived as an atheist. I've lived as a skeptic. I've lived miserable with no hope. And I'm going to tell you what, I'm going with the guy who came back from the dead. So you can come up to me and you can try to tell me about another God. You can even tell me that you are God. I'm going to need to see some proof. I'm going to need to see you come back from the dead. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you today. Lord, that you not only proclaimed yourself as truth, you demonstrated the truth. You said that if people did not believe the words that you said, believe the works that you did. You backed up your claim. And now 2,000 years later, there's no one else that's ever had a claim like your claim. You're the name above every name. You're the claim above every claim. You're worthy of following as our Lord and our Savior. And if there's somebody here who's never trusted you as their Lord and Savior, I pray today they would repent of their sin, turn from their sin, and turn to you as the Lord and Master of their life. Father, give all